Seventh-day Adventists are one of a handful of Protestant denominations that believe Christians should rest on the seventh day like ancient Israel and the Jews do today. They base this belief on the Ten Commandments. In addition, they believe the seventh day Sabbath is the only day God set aside as a special day of worship. They believe that honoring any other day is disobedience to God's command. If Adventists are correct, then why do Christians attend worship services on Sunday? Adventists teach that in AD 321, the Roman Emperor Constantine issued an edict declaring Sunday as the day of Christian worship and that the Catholic Church caved to the Emperor's edict by shifting the sacred day from the seventh to the first day of the week. But did the Catholic Church really change the Sabbath day to Sunday? Is there really more to the story? We begin a new series that will be exploring the answers to those questions. We will start at the beginning from Genesis to Mount Sinai, to the life of Christ, to the Reformation, through the 17th century Sabbath wars, all the way to the end of the world. We will be telling the epic tale of this holy day. This is the story of the Sabbath. In episode one, we looked at Creation Week, focusing on the blessed and holy seventh day on which God rested. We discussed the theories of theologians who have earnestly grappled with a question about this first rest day. Did God's rest on the seventh day stand as an example for humans? If so, on what day were we supposed to cease from our labors? The seventh day of the week, or the month, or the year? The Bible doesn't tell us. And how do we know which day is the seventh day? Did God expect humans to keep track of an endless seven-day cycle? Or did God keep track of the Sabbaths, basing them on the four monthly phases of the moon? That is the question we explored in the second episode. We looked at both sides of the argument of whether ancient Israel's Sabbaths were based on the lunar cycle or an endless seven-day cycle calculated by Israel's leaders. For Christians, the Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And if the Bible is one's sole authority for doctrine, and if we are supposed to keep a Sabbath based on the creation week, why? Why is the scripture silent about the Sabbath for 2,500 years? If the seventh day rest were a command from God from the beginning, and it was supposed to be a weekly Sabbath based on man's calculations of an endless seven day weekly cycle, then why wasn't that clearly stated in Genesis 2? During that vast span of time between creation and Mount Sinai, there was no record of a Sabbath day kept by anyone. If God wanted humans to keep a day of rest from creation onward, why not be clear about it in Scripture? Mankind had to wait for at least 25 centuries to hear the first hint of a command for any human to keep a day of rest. But after those many centuries, God did return to the topic of the rest days. But at first, they weren't weekly Sabbaths. In episode 3, we looked at the other Sabbath days, the rest days Adventists don't normally discuss. These other rest days given to Israel before the Ten Commandments were given on Mount Sinai. In this episode, we will be talking about the history of the Jewish synagogue and its relationship to the Sabbath. Why bring up the Jewish synagogue? What has this got to do with the Sabbath? And why now at this point in the story? As we tell the story of the Sabbath 
we are trying to go chronologically. And the synagogue is a very ancient history that begins right here in early Israel. The second point for the prominence of this synagogue in our story is that many Christians make parallel assumptions about the synagogue and the rest day of creation week. They believe that God rested on the seventh day of creation as an example that we are to follow. Often these same people believe that Christ's tradition of going to the synagogue on Sabbath is also an example we are to follow. The premise is the same for both. We have to follow Jesus' example, even when there is no evidence at all in either story that commands all humans to keep Sabbath by resting or attending the synagogue, and by inference for Christians to go to church. So in this video, we will briefly outline the history of the synagogue, compare it to the temple, and then finally explain why it is impossible for Jesus to have gone to any synagogue to worship. There are dozens of books that try to map out the history of Jewish synagogues. Historians have found little conclusive evidence to prove how and when the synagogue showed up in ancient Israel. So this lack of archeological evidence and documentation has led to several theories. What we do know is that synagogue is not a Hebrew word. Before the Christian era, Greek scholars translated the Hebrew word Knesset, meaning assembly, to the Greek word synagogue. It originally didn't mean a building, but just a gathering of Israel. There is debate how the word synagogue developed over the centuries. Scholars ask if synagogue is the word for assembly, what kind of assembly was it referring to? A religious assembly or a civic assembly? Was the synagogue a building or just an informal group that met anywhere including outside. Historians agree that when Israel was deprived of worship, when they could not make pilgrimages to the temple in Jerusalem, either voluntarily or involuntarily, they began a local assembly for prayer or study of Torah. But no one is certain that these groups were the forerunner of the synagogues. Some Jewish scholars believe the first synagogue occurred when Israel returned from their exile in Babylon at the time of the priest Ezra. As the temple in Jerusalem was being rebuilt so that the worship could restart, the sacrificial system could return, Ezra saw a great need to teach the returning Israelites who may have been without authoritative instruction for 70 years he called together an assembly of Israel on the second, fifth, and seventh day of each week. This, some scholars claim, is the beginning of what would later be the Jewish synagogue. Other historians teach that the first synagogues were elders who assembled by the city gates to adjudicate Hebrew law, a strictly civic assembly that did not include anything religious. Others believe the assembly started with the groups of the Israelite women meeting at rivers for prayers. These scholars believe that over the centuries, the definition of the word synagogue developed from the meaning groups of Israelites meeting together anywhere to the actual building itself where they met. Whether it be at the time of Manasseh when idols were introduced at the temple or at the Babylonian exile, or at the diaspora. Israel would assemble together to keep unity and their culture identity alive. Where theories of the synagogue end and evidence begins to appear is near the time of Christ. At some point, the great synagogue was a building adjacent to the Jerusalem temple where the Sanhedrin could meet. There, they would try and execute judgment on criminals, house and feed pilgrims, and distribute charity, as well as argue politics. 
It was only after the fall of the Second Temple in AD 70 that Israel no longer had a place of worship, so the synagogues became a refuge for people without a place to offer sacrifice and worship. With the destruction of the temple, those Israelites who rejected the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, their Messiah, no longer had a way to renew their covenant with God. Therefore, a few surviving Pharisees agreed and taught that the sacredness of the temple was transferred to the synagogue as a place of worship for Israel. But before we jump ahead, we want to focus on the first century. Let's compare the synagogue and the temple at the time of Christ. At the temple, Israel worshipped. In fact, God allowed worship at only one place after the temple was built. Worship to Israel meant a renewal of their covenant with God through sharing a covenant meal. Before this covenant renewal, Israel had to purify themselves of physical sins by the atonement ritual of confession, sacrifice, and offering of the blood of an innocent, Levitically clean animal, such as a lamb or a dove or a bull. Then the Israelite could come before the Holy of Holies in adoration. Then the covenant meal was shared. Although sacred music, praise, bowing, prayers, and the yearly Torah readings happened during worship, these things were supplemental and not the focus. No public worship could occur without a sacrifice, and no sacrifice could occur outside the temple at Jerusalem. The temple was the exclusive place for Israel's communal worship of the one true God. The temple was the sole and only place Israel could worship, for that was the exclusive place of the Holy of Holies where God's divinity chose to dwell. The temple revolved around rites, rituals, set liturgies, and common prayers. The large Levite choir could be heard daily. Trumpets called people to worship. The synagogue was where the lay members or non-clergy Israelites would lead assemblies in Torah reading and discussions and perhaps personal prayers, though that itself is debated among scholars. The temple was built to glorify God with massive stones and precious gems covered in gold and housed sacred items consecrated to God. The synagogue could be outside or in a person's home or a simple wooden structure. It was not considered a sacred place at the time of Christ. God commanded each Israelite adult male to come to the temple three times a year to participate in public communal worship. God did not command anyone to attend the synagogue as it was during the time of Christ. Hebrew was considered a sacred language and the priests could only speak Hebrew in the temple. In the synagogue, the local dialect was spoken. At the time of Christ, the synagogue was not seen as a holy place, nor could it be seen as a place of worship. While private prayer and Bible study occurred, in today's Adventist context, that you might see it in an Adventist context, it would be more comparable to a school than a church, as some Adventist students might meet in an SDA University classroom and discuss the Sabbath school lesson, the synagogue was an informal civic meeting hall that often included a school. The synagogue at the time of Christ was predominantly a secular building used as a community center for the distribution of charity and a bank was often in it. There were synagogues with no religious events occurring there. It often was a hostel for pilgrims to stay the night, and it included a public bath and place to dine, 
It was used for weddings and political debates. Philo was a Jewish philosopher that lived in Alexandria and was a contemporary of Jesus' parents. He reported that many synagogues he knew of had statues of emperors or local governors, as well as civic murals, inscriptions, shields, tributes to honor the pagan rulers who either sponsored or protected the synagogues. In one synagogue, Philo wrote that there was a large statue of a Roman leader riding in a chariot driven by four horses. While many Hebrews were happy to pray for and support their Roman government because they considered the synagogue a civic center, in a few areas this practice caused rioting. Interestingly, these riots could be other Jews believing that these tributes to the Romans showed support for their enemies while many non-Jews rioted against the synagogues because they hated the Jews and didn't want the government to support them. Philo did not consider having visual signs of support for the government in a synagogue to be controversial. In fact, he was thankful that the government granted them the funds to build their meeting houses. The synagogue was the local court building used by leaders, or the Sanhedrin, for trials, sentencing, and punishment. Paul tells us in Acts 26.11 that he often punished Christians in the synagogues. First century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus was born in Jerusalem a few years after Christ's death. We derive a lot of our knowledge about the Jews at the time of Christ from his writings. He de details the story of the political debates that occurred at the synagogues that could be become heated to the point of violence, both threatened and materialized. Once Josephus had to enter the synagogue in a breastplate with a sword to protect himself from brethren he heard were going to kill him over a political matter. As we can see, the synagogue might have been a center for a discussion of Torah, but it was a multi-purpose civic building for Israel. As synagogue historian Heather A. McKay writes about the synagogue on the Sabbath during the time of Jesus, there are Sabbath gatherings there is no Sabbath worship. And when Jews assemble on the Sabbath, it is not to worship, but to read, study, and discuss Torah. The Gospels tell us that it was Christ's custom to go to the synagogue on Sabbath, or the Greek word etho. But we have three assumptions we must overcome in order to use this information to prove Christians must keep the Sabbath. First, that Jesus is our example by going to the synagogue on Sabbath. Second, that somehow the word tradition or custom would support the idea that Jesus did it as part of a commandment of God. And third, that Christ going to the synagogue meant that he was going to a church-like building to worship God. History reports that at the time of Christ, Israel did not view the synagogue similarly to how Christians view church. Only after AD 70, when Israel loses its exclusive place of worship at the temple, did the synagogue evolve into a place of Jewish worship? The rabbis, in total shock of losing their place of worship without God's blessing or permission, 
decided to transfer the holiness of the Holy of Holies and the true presence of God to the synagogue and study of the Torah. Then the Torah scrolls became the point of sacredness. If the synagogue was nothing more than a civic building in which they would hold a religious school and have prayers as well as a courthouse and center of charity, and all the evidence reports this, then no Christian would accept that God wants us to go to a civic center on the seventh day, even if Christ did it. Jesus did not attend the synagogue as an example for us, nor by going to the synagogue was he attending a church service. He wasn't attending a synagogue in order to keep the fourth commandment. He was going because that is where he could best announce the gospel. That is where the Jews were. Jesus entered the synagogues in order to bring the good news of the Messiah to his people. He healed in the synagogues. He taught in the synagogues. He cast out demons at the synagogue. Whether the synagogues in Galilee, Nazareth, Capernaum, Jesus went where the people were in order to bring them the good news that the Messiah had arrived and he was among them. If there was a text in scripture that says Jesus went to the temple on Sabbath in fulfillment of the law, we could conclude that Israel had a required worship service each Sabbath, but that is not what is written in Scripture. Attending a Torah study at the synagogue on Sabbath was a tradition established by Israel that Christ followed. Torah study at the synagogue was merely a custom, not one of God's laws. The synagogue was not the place Israel renewed its covenant with God. No sacrifice was allowed in a synagogue. Therefore, it was not a place where forgiveness could be found. God's presence was not at the synagogue. Jesus, as all Israel, went to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God. There was the sacrifice of the innocent lamb. There was forgiveness. There was the Holy of Holies. At the temple was Father's presence. And within the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant that originally held the Ten Commandments, the Rod of Aaron, and the Jar of Manna. These were all symbols of the Messiah who would come fulfilling the Old Covenant laws and saving Israel. All heaven and all history breathlessly anticipated this moment, the moment God became man and dwelt among us. And now was the amazing Trinitarian moment where Christ, the Son of God, stood in the temple with the Shekinah glory, the mysterious cloud in the Holy of Holies, with the Father's presence, all were God. The synagogue was developed by man, run by man, and filled with men. There was a great difference in these two places. Only one was holy, the temple. Jesus did not identify himself with the synagogue, but with the temple. And ultimately, Jesus was greater than the temple, for it was a shadow of the temple of his body. And today, our bodies are the temple of God. By his sacrifice, Christ transferred the holiness of the temple into his people. The shadows and prophecies all align and are fulfilled in this one man. 
Christ. He is the purpose of all of Israel's covenant. Behold the man. We encourage Sabbatarians to look into this subject, and we have some sources at the end of this video. God bless you. Thank you.